Section 41 of Essays, Book 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Malone. Essays, Book 2 by Michel de Montaigne. Translated by Charles Cotton. Apology for Raymond Sibond. Learning is, indeed, a very great and a very material accomplishment, and those who despise it sufficiently discover their own want of understanding. But learning, yet I do not prize it at the excessive rate that some others do, as Herillus, the philosopher for one, who therein places the sovereign good, and maintained that it was only in her to render us wise and contented, which I do not believe, no more than I do what others have said, that learning is the mother of all virtue, and that all vice proceeds from ignorance, which, if it be true, required a very long interpretation. My house has long been open to men of knowledge, and is very well known to them, for my father, who governed it for fifty years and upwards, inflamed with the new ardor with which Francis I embraced letters, and brought them into esteem, with great diligence and expense hunted after the acquaintance of learned men, receiving them into his house as persons sacred and that had some particular inspiration of divine wisdom, collecting their sayings and sentences as so many oracles, and with so much the greater reverence and religion as he was the less able to judge of them, for he had no knowledge of letters any more than his predecessors. For my part I love them well, but I do not adore them. Amongst others, Peter Bunel, a man of great reputation for knowledge in his time, having, with some others of his sort, stayed some days at Montaigne in my father's company, he presented him at his departure with a book entitled Theologia Naturalis, Siwe Liber Creatur Arum Magistri Raimondi de Sebond, and as the Italian and Spanish tongues were familiar to my father, and as this book was written in a sort of jargon of Spanish with Latin terminations, he hoped that, with a little help, he might be able to understand it, and therefore recommended it to him for a very useful book, and proper for the time wherein he gave it to him, which was when the novel doctrines of Luther began to be in vogue, and in many places to stagger our ancient belief wherein he was very well advised, wisely in his own reason, foreseeing the beginning of this distemper would easily run into an execrable atheism, for the vulgar, not having the faculty of judging of things, suffering themselves to be carried away by chance and appearance, after having once been inspired with the boldness to despise and control those opinions which they had before had in extreme reference, such as those wherein their salvation is concerned, and that some of the articles of their religion are brought into doubt and dispute, they afterwards throw all other parts of their belief into the same uncertainty they having with them no other authority or foundation than the others they had already discomposed, and shake off all the impressions they had received from the authority of the laws, or the reverence of the ancient customs, as a tyrannical yoke. Nam cupide con col caternimis antimetutum For with most eagerness they spurn the law, by which they were before most kept in awe. Resolving to admit nothing for the future to which they had not first interposed their own decrees, and given their particular consent, 
It happened that my father, a little before his death, having accidentally found this book under a heap of other neglected papers, commanded me to translate it for him into French. It is good to translate such authors as this, where there is little but the matter itself to express. But such wherein grace of language and elegance of style are aimed at are dangerous to attempt, especially when a man is to turn them into a weaker idiom. It was a strange and a new undertaking for me, but uh, having by chance at that time nothing else to do, and not being able to resist the command of the best father that ever was, I did it as well as I could, and he was so well pleased with it as to order it to be printed, which after his death was done. I found the ideas of this author exceeding fine, the contexture of his work well followed, and the design full of piety, and because many people take a delight to read it, and particularly the ladies, to whom we owe the most service, I have often thought to assist them to clear the book of two principal objections made to it. His design is bold and daring for he undertakes, by human and natural reasons, to establish and make good against the atheists all the articles of the Christian religion, wherein, to speak the truth, he is so firm and so successful that I do not think it possible to do better upon that subject. Nay, I believe he has been equaled by none. This work seeming to me to be too beautiful and too rich for an author whose name is so little known, and of whom all that we know is that he was a Spaniard, practicing physic at Toulouse about two hundred years ago, I inquired of Adrian Tournabus, who knew all things, what he thought of that book, who made answer, that he thought it was some abstract drawn from St. Thomas d'Aquin, for that, in truth, his mind, so full of infinite erudition and admirable subtlety, was alone capable of such thoughts. Be that as it may, whoever was the author and inventor, and tis not reasonable without greater certainty to deprive Sibon of that title, he was a man of great judgment, and most admirable parts. The first thing they reprehend in his work is that Christians are to blame to repose their belief upon human reason, which is only conceived by faith and the particular inspiration of divine grace. In which objection there appears to be something of zeal to piety, and therefore we are to endeavor to satisfy those who put it forth with the greater mildness and respect. This were a task more proper for a man well read in divinity than for me who know nothing of it. Nevertheless, I conceive that in a thing so divine, so high, and so far transcending all human intelligence, as is that truth which which it has pleased the bounty of God to enlighten us, it is very necessary that he should moreover lend us his assistance, as a very extraordinary favor and privilege, to conceive and imprint it in our understanding. And I do not believe that means purely human are in any sort capable of doing it. For if they were, so many rare and excellent souls, and so abundantly furnished with natural force in former ages, could not have failed, by their reason, to arrive at this knowledge. Tis faith alone that lively mind certainly comprehends the deep mysteries of our religion. But withal, I do not say that it is not a worthy and very laudable attempt to accommodate those natural and human utensils with which God has endowed us to the service of our faith. It is not to be doubted but that it is the most noble use we can put them to, and that there is not a design in a Christian man more noble 
than to make it the aim and end of all of his studies to extend and amplify the truth of his belief. We do not satisfy ourselves with serving God with our souls and understandings only. We moreover owe and render him a corporal service and apply our limbs and motions and external things to him honor. We must here do the same and accompany our faith with all the reason we have. But always with this reservation, not to fancy that it is upon us that it depends, nor that our arguments and endeavors can arrive at so supernatural and divine a knowledge. If it enters not into us by an extraordinary infusion, if it enters not only by reason, but moreover by human ways, it is not in us in its true dignity and splendor. And yet, I am afraid, we only have it by this way. If we hold upon God by the mediation of a lively faith, if we hold upon God by him and not by us, if we had a divine basis and foundation, human occasions would not have the power to shake us as they do. Our fortress would not surrender to so weak a battery. The love of novelty, the constraint of princes, the success of one party, and the rash and fortuitous change of our opinions would not have the power to stagger and alter our belief. We should not then leave it to the mercy of every new argument, nor abandon it to all the rhetoric in the world. We should withstand the fury of these waves with an immovable and unyielding constancy. As a great rock repels the rolling tides that foam and bark about her marble sides from its strong bulk. If we were but touched with this ray of divinity, it would appear throughout. Not only our words, but our works also would carry its brightness and luster. Whatever proceeded from us would be seen illuminated with this noble light. We ought to be ashamed that in all the human sex there never was any of the faction that did not in some measure conform his life and behavior to it, whereas so divine and heavenly institution does only distinguish Christians by the name. Will you see the proof of this? Compare our manners to those of a Mohammedan or pagan you will still find that we fall very short. Where, out of regard to the reputation and advantage of our religion, we ought to shine in excellency at a vast distance beyond all others, and that it should be said of us, Are they so just, so charitable, so good? Then they are Christians. All other signs are common to all religions, hope, trust, events, ceremonies, penance, martyrs. The peculiar mark of our truth ought to be our virtue, as it is also the most heavenly and difficult and the most worthy product of truth. For this our good Saint Louis was in the right, who when the Tartar king, who was become Christian, designed to come to Lyon to kiss the Pope's feet, and there to be an eye-witness of the sanctity he hoped to find in our manner, immediately diverted him from his purpose, for fear lest our disorderly way of living should, on the contrary, put him out of conceit with so holy a belief. And yet it happened quite otherwise, since to that other, who, going to Rome to the same end, and there seeing the dissoluteness of the prelates and the people of that time, settled himself so much the more firmly in our religion, considering how great the force and divinity of it must necessarily be that could maintain its dignity and splendor amongst so much corruption, and in so vicious hands. If we had but one single grain of faith, we should remove mountains from their places, saith the sacred word.
Our actions that would then be directed and accompanied by the divinity would not be merely human, they would have in them something of miraculous, as well as our belief. Brevis est institutio vitae honestae beataeque, si credes. Believe, and the way to happiness and virtue is a short one. Some oppose upon the world that they believe that which they did not. Others, more in number, make themselves believe that they believe, not being able to penetrate into what it is to believe. We think it strange if, in the civil war which at this time disorders our state, we see events float and vary after a common and ordinary manner which is because we bring nothing to it but our own. Justice, which is in one party, is only there for ornament and palliation. It is indeed pretended, but tis not there received, settled, and espoused. It is there as in the mouth of an advocate, not as in the heart and affection of the party. God owes his extraordinary assistance to faith and religion, not to our passions. Men there are the conductors, and therein serve themselves with religion, whereas it ought to be quite contrary. Observe, if it be not only by our hands that we guide and train it, and draw it like a wax into so many contrary figures, from a rule in itself so direct and firm. When and where was this more manifest than in France in our days? They who have taken it on the left hand, they who have taken it on the right, they who call it black, and they who call it white, alike employ it to their violent and ambitious designs, conduct it with a progress so conform in riot and injustice that they render the diversity they pretended in their opinions, in a thing whereon the conduct and rule of our life depends, doubtful and hard to believe. Did one ever see, come from the same school and discipline, manners more united and more the same? Do but observe with what horrid impudence we toss divine arguments to and fro, and how irreligiously we have both rejected and retaken them accord as fortune has shifted our places in these intested storms this so solemn proposition whether it be lawful for a subject to rebel and take up arms against his prince for the defence of his religion do you remember in whose mouths the last year the affirmative of it was the prop of one party and the negative pillar of another and hearken now from what quarter comes the voice and instruction of the one and the other, and if arms make less noise and rattle for this cause than for that. We condemn those to the fire who say that truth must be made to bear the yoke of our necessity. And how much worse does France than say it? Let us confess the truth. Whoever should draw out from the army, even that raised by the king, those who would take up arms out of pure zeal to religion, and also those who only do it to protect the laws of their country, or for the service of their prince, could hardly, out of both these put together, make one complete company of gendarmes? Whence does this proceed, that there are so few to be found who have maintained the same will and the same progress in our civil commotions, and that we see them one while move but a foot pace, and in another run at full speed. And the same men one while damage our affairs by their violent heat and fierceness, and in another by their coldness, gentleness, and slowness. But that they are pushed on by particular and casual considerations, according to the variety wherein they move. I evidently perceive that we do not willingly afford devotion any other offices but those that least suit with our own passions. 
their hostility so admirable as the Christian. Our zeal performs wonders when it seconds our inclinations to hatred, cruelty, ambition, avarice, detraction, and rebellion. But when it moves against the hair, towards bounty, benignity, and temperance, unless by miracle some rare and virtuous disposition prompts us to it, we stir neither hand nor foot. Our religion is intended to extirpate vices, whereas it screens, nourishes, and incites them. We must not mock God, if we believed in him, I do not say by faith, but with a simple belief, that is to say, and I speak it to our great shame, if we believed in him and recognized him as we do any other history, or as we would do one of our companions, we should love him above all other things, for the infinite bounty and beauty that shines in him. At least he would go equal in our affection with riches, pleasure, glory, and our friends. The best of us is not so much afraid to outrage him as he is afraid to injure his neighbor, his kinsman, or his master. Is there any understanding so weak that having on one side the object of one of our vicious pleasures, and on the other, in equal knowledge and persuasion, the state of an immortal glory, would change the first for the other? And yet we often renounce this out of mere contempt, for what lust tempts us to blaspheme, if not perhaps the very desire to offend. The philosopher Antisthenes, as he was being initiated in the mysteries of Orpheus, the priest telling him that those who professed themselves of that religion were certain to receive perfect and eternal felicity after death. If thou believest that, answered he, why dost thou not die thyself? Diogenes, more rudely, according to his manner, and ro more remote from our purpose, to the priest that in like manner preached to him, to become of his religion, that he might obtain the happiness of the other world. What? said he. Thou wouldst have me to believe that Agesilaus and Epimondas, who were so great men, should be miserable, and thou, who art but a calf, and canst do nothing to purpose, shalt be happy because thou art a priest? Did we receive these great promises of eternal beatitude with the same reverence and respect that we do a philosophical discourse? We should not have death in so great horror. Non yam se moriens dissolvi concurretur, sed magus iri for us, spemque relinquere ang ais gauderet prilonga senex aut corno acervus. We should not, on a deathbed, grieve to be dissolved, but rather launch out cheerfully from our old hut, and with the snake be glad to cast off the corrupted slough we had, or with the old stag rejoice to be now clear from the large horns too ponderous grown to bear. I desire to be dissolved, we should say, and to be with Jesus Christ. The force of Plato's arguments concerning the immortality of the soul set some of his disciples to seek a premature grave that they might the sooner enjoy the things he had made them hope for. All this is a most evident sign that we only receive our religion after our own fashion, by our own hands, and no otherwise than as other religions are received. Either we are happened in the country where it is in practice, or we reverence the antiquity of it, or the authority of the men who have maintained it, or fear the menaces it fulminates against misbelievers, or are allured by its promises. These considerations ought, tis true, uh, to, to be applied to our belief, but as subsidiaries only, for they are human obligations. Another religion, other witnesses, the like promises and threats, 
might by the same way imprint a quite contrary belief. We are Christians by the same title that we are Perigordians or Germans, and what Plato says, that there are few men so obstinate in their atheism whom a pressing danger will not reduce to an acknowledgment of the divine power, does not concern a true Christian. Tis for mortal and human religions to be received by human recommendation. What kind of faith can that be that cowardice and want of courage establish in us? A pleasant faith that does not believe what it believes, but for want of courage to disbelieve. Can a vicious passion such as inconstancy and astonishment cause any regular product in our souls? They are confident in their judgment, says he, that what is said of hell and future torments is all feigned, but an occasion of making the expedient presenting itself when old age or diseases bring them to the brink of the grave, the terror of death by the horror of that future condition inspires them with a new belief. And by reason that such impressions render them timorous, he forbids in his laws all such threatening doctrines and all persuasion that anything of ill can befall a man from the gods excepting for his great good when they happen to him, and for a medicinal effect. They say of Bion that, infected with the atheism of Theodorus, he had had long religious men in great scorn and contempt, but that death surprising him, he gave himself up to the most extreme superstition, as if the gods withdrew and returned according to the necessities of Bion. Plato in these examples would conclude that we are brought to a belief of God either by reason or by force, atheism being a proposition as unnatural as monstrous, difficult also and hard to establish in the human understanding. How arrogant soever! There are men enough seen, out of vanity and pride, to be the authors of extraordinary and reforming opinions, and outwardly to affect the profession of them, who, if they are such fools, have nevertheless not the power to plant them in their own conscience. Yet will they not fail to lift up their hands towards heaven if you give them a good thrust with a sword in the breast? And when fear or sickness has abated and dulled the licentious fury of this giddy humor, they will easily reunite and very discreetly suffer themselves to be reconciled to the public faith and examples. A doctrine seriously digested is one thing, and those superficial impressions another, which, springing from the disorder of an unhinged understanding, float at random and great uncertainty in the fancy. Miserable and senseless men who strive to be worse than they can. The error of paganism and the ignorance of our sacred truth. Let this great soul of Plato, but great only in human greatness, fall into this other mistake, that children and old men were the most susceptible of religion as if it sprung and derived its credit from our weakness, that naught that ought to bind the judgment and the will, that ought to restrain the soul and join it to our Creator, should be a knot that derives its foldings and strength, not from our considerations, from our reasons and passions, but from a divine and supernatural constraint, having one form, one face, and one luster, which is the authority of God and His divine grace. Now the heart and soul, being governed and commanded by faith, tis but reason that they should muster all our other faculties, according as they are able to perform to the service and assistance of their design. Neither is it to be imagined that all this machine has not some marks imprinted upon it, 
by the hand of the mighty architect, and that there is not in the things of this world some image that in some measure resembles the workman who has built and formed them. He has, in his stupendous works, left the character of his divinity, and tis our own weakness only that hinders us from discerning it. Tis what he himself is pleased to tell us, that he manifests his invisible operations to us by those that are visible. Subon applied himself to this laudable and noble study, and demonstrates to us that there is not any part or member of the world that disclaims or derogates from its maker. It were to do wrong to the divine goodness did not the universe consent to our belief. The heavens, the earth, the elements, our bodies, and our souls, all things concur to this. We have but to find out the way to use them. They instruct us if we are capable of instruction. For this world is a sacred temple into which man is introduced there to contemplate statues, not the works of a mortal hand, but such as the divine purpose has made the objects of sense the sun, the stars, the water, and the earth, to represent those that are intelligible to us. The invisible tilings of God, says St. Paul, appear by the creation of the world, his eternal wisdom and divinity being considered by his works. And God himself envies not men the grace of seeing and admiring heaven's face, but rolling it about he still anew presents its varied splendor to our view, and in our minds himself inculcates, so that we, the almighty mover, well may know, instructing us by seeing him the cause of ill to revere and obey his laws. Now our prayers and human discourses are but a sterile and undigested matter. The grace of God is the form, Tis that which gives fashion and value to it. As the virtuous actions of Socrates and Cato remain vain and fruitless for not having had the love and obedience to the true creator of all things, so is it with our imaginations and discourses. They have a kind of body, but it is an informed mass without fashion and without light if faith and grace be not added thereto. Faith coming to tinct and illustrate Sibon's arguments renders them firm and stolid, and to that degree that they are capable of serving for directions, and of being the first guides to an elementary Christian to put him into the way of this knowledge. They in some measure form him to and render him capable of the grace of God by which means he afterwards completes and perfects himself in the true belief. I know a man of authority, bred up to letters, who has confessed to me to have been brought back from the errors of unbelief by Sibon's arguments. And should they be stripped of this ornament and of the assistance and approbation of the faith, and be looked upon as mere fancies only, to contend with those who are precipitated into the dreadful and horrible darkness of irreligion, they will even there find them as solid and firm as any others of the same quality that can be opposed against them, so that we shall be ready to say to our opponents, Si melius quid habes arcese, well imperium fair. If you have arguments more fit, produce them, or to these submit. Let them admit the force of our reasons, or let them show us others, and upon some other subject, better woven and of finer thread. I am unawares half engaged in the second objection, to which I propose to make answer in this behalf of Sibon. Some say that his arguments are weak and unable to make good what he intends, and undertake with great ease to confute them. 
These are to be a little more roughly handled, for they are more dangerous and malicious than the first men willingly rest the sayings of others to favor their own prejudicate opinions. To an atheist, all writings tend to atheism. He corrupts the most innocent matter with his own venom. These have their judgments so prepossessed that they cannot relish Sibon's reasons. As to the rest, they think we give them very fair play in putting them into the liberty of combating our religion with weapons merely human, whom, in Her Majesty, full of authority and command, they durst not attack. The means that I shall use, and that I think most proper to subdue this frenzy, is to crush and spurn underfoot pride and human arrogance, to make them sensible of the inanity, vanity, and vileness of man, to wrest the wretched arms of their reason out of their hands, to make them bow down and bite the ground under the authority and reverence of the Divine Majesty. Tis to that alone that knowledge and wisdom appertain. That alone can make a true estimate of itself, and from which we purloin whatever we value ourselves upon. Greek God permits not any being but himself to be truly wise. Let us subdue this presumption, the first foundation of the tyranny of the evil spirit. Deus superbis resistit humilibus autem dat gratiam. God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Understanding is in the gods, says Plato, and not at all or very little in men. Now it is in the meantime a great consolation to a Christian man to see our frail and mortal parts so fitly suited to our holy and divine faith that when we employ them to the subjects of their own mortal and frail nature, they are not even there more unitedly or more firmly adjusted. Let us see, then, if man has in his power other more forcible and convincing reasons than those of Sibon. That is to say, if it be in him to arrive at any certainty by argument and reason. For St. Augustine, disputing against these people, has good cause to reproach them with injustice. In that they maintain the part of our belief to be false that our reason cannot establish, and to show that a great many things may be, and have been, of which their nature could not sound the reason and causes. He proposes to them certain known and undoubted experiments wherein men confess they see nothing. And this he does, as all other things, with a curious and ingenious inquisition. We must do more than this, and make them know that, to convince the weakness of their reason, there is no necessity of culling out uncommon examples, and that it is so defective and so blind that there is no faculty clear enough for it, that to it the easy and the hard are all one, that all subjects equally, and nature in general, disclaim its authority and reject its mediation. What does truth mean when she preaches to us to fly worldly philosophy? when she often inculcates to us that our wisdom is but folly in the sight of God, that the vainest of all vanities is man, that the man who presumes upon his wisdom does not yet know what wisdom is, and that man, who is nothing, if he thinks himself to be anything, does seduce and deceive himself. These sentences of the Holy Spirit do so clearly and vividly express that which I would maintain, that I should need no other proof against men who would with all humility and obedience submit to his authority. But these will be whipped at their own expense, and will not suffer a man to oppose their reason but by itself. Let us then for once consider a man alone, without foreign assistance, 
armed only with his own proper arms and unfurnished of the divine grace and wisdom, which is all his honor, strength, and the foundation of his being. Let us see how he stands in this fine equipage, let him make me understand by the force of his reason upon what foundations he has built those great advantages he thinks he has over all other creatures. Who has made him believe that this admirable motion of the celestial arch, the eternal light of those luminaries that roll so high over his head? the wondrous and fearful motions of that infinite ocean should be established and continue so many ages for his service and convenience. Can anything be imagined so ridiculous that this miserable and wretched creature who is not so much as master of himself, but subject to the injuries of all things, should call himself master and emperor of the world, of which he has not power to know the least part? much less to command the whole. And the privilege which he attributes to himself of being the only creature in this vast fabric who has the understanding to discover the beauty and the parts of it, the only one who can return thanks to the architect and keep account of the revenues and disbursements of the world. Who, I wonder, sealed him this patent? Let us see his commission for this great employment. Was it granted in favor of the wise only? Few people will be concerned in it. Are fools and wicked persons worthy so extraordinary favor, and, being the worst part of the world, to be preferred before the rest? Shall we believe this man? For whose sake shall we therefore conclude that the world was made? For theirs who have the use of reason? These are gods and men than whom certainly nothing can be better. We can never sufficiently decry the impudence of this conjunction. What, wretched creature, what has he in himself worthy of such an advantage? Considering the incorruptible existence of the celestial bodies, beauty, magnitude, and continual revolution by so exact a rule, Com suspicumus moini caelestia mundi, templa super, stellisque me cantibus aethera finum, et velat in me cantem lunae solisque viarum. When we the heavenly arch above behold, and the vast sky adorned with stars of gold, and mark the regular course that the sun and moon in their alternate progress run, Considering the dominion and influence those bodies have, not only over our lives and fortunes, fact et inim et vitas hominum suspended abartis, men's lives and actions on the stars depend. But even over our inclinations, our thoughts and wills, which they govern, incite, and agitate at the mercy of their influences, as our reason teaches us. Contemplating the stars, he finds that they rule by a secret and a silent sway, and that the enameled spheres which roll above do ever by alternate causes move, and studying these he can also foresee by certain signs the turns of destiny. Seeing that not only a man, not only kings, but that monarchies, empires, and all this lower world follow the influence of the celestial motions. How great a change a little motion brings, so great this kingdom is that governs kings. If our virtue, our vices, our knowledge, and this very discourse we are upon of the power of the stars, and the comparison we are making betwixt them and us proceed, as our reason supposes, from their favor, one man in love may cross the raging main to level lofty Ilium with the plain. Another's fate inclines him more by far to study laws and statutes for the bar. Sons kill their father, fathers kill their sons, and one armed brother against another runs. This war is not theirs, but fates that spurs them on to shed the blood which shed they must bemoan 
and I ascribe it to the will of fate that on this theme I now expatiate. If we derive this little portion of reason we have from the bounty of heaven, how is it possible that reason should ever make us equal to it? How subject its essence and condition to our knowledge? Whatever we see in those bodies astonishes us. Qua molitio, qua ferramenta, qui vectes, qua machina, qui ministri tanti operas fuerunt. What contrivance, what tools, what materials, what engines were employed about so stupendous a work? Why do we deprive them of soul, of life, and discourse? Have we discovered in them any immovable or insensible stupidity, we who have no commerce with them but by obedience? Shall we say that we have discovered in no other creature but man the use of a reasonable soul? What? Have we seen anything like the sun? Does he cease to be because we have seen nothing like him? And do his motions cease because there are no other like them? If what we have not seen is not, our knowledge is marvelously contracted. Quaisunt tatai anami angustiae. How narrow are our understandings. Are they not dreams of human vanity, to make the moon a celestial earth, there to fancy mountains and vales, as an Anaxagoras did, there to fix habitations and human abodes, and plant colonies for our convenience, as Plato and Plutarch have done, and of our earth to make a luminous and resplendent star? Amongst the other inconveniences of mortality, this is one that darkness of the understanding which leads men astray, not so much from a necessity of erring, but from a love of error. The corruptible body stupefies the soul, and the earthly habitation dulls the faculties of the imagination. End of section 41. Reading by Malone. Section 42 of Essays, Book 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cynthia Moyer. Essays, Book 2, by Michel de Montaigne. Translated by Charles Cotton. Apology for Raymond Seban. Part 2. Presumption is our natural and original disease. The most wretched and frail of all creatures is man, and withal the proudest. He feels and sees himself lodged here in the dirt and filth of the world nailed and riveted to the worst and deadest part of the universe, in the lowest story of the house, the most remote from the heavenly arch, with animals of the worst condition of the three, and yet in his imagination will be placing himself above the circle of the moon and bringing the heavens under his feet. Tis by the same vanity of imagination that he equals himself to God, attributes to himself divine qualities, withdraws and separates himself from the crowd of other creatures, cuts out the shares of the animals, his fellows and companions, and distributes to them portions of faculties and force as himself thinks fit. How does he know, by the strength of his understanding, the secret and internal motions of animals? From what comparison betwixt them and us does he conclude the stupidity he attributes to them? When I play with my cat, who knows whether I do not make her more sport than she makes me? 
we mutually divert one another with our play if i have my hour to begin or to refuse she also has hers plato in his picture of the golden age under saturn reckons among the chief advantages that a man then had his communication with beasts of whom inquiring and informing himself he knew the true qualities and differences of them all by which he acquired a very perfect intelligence and prudence and led his life more happily than we could do need we a better proof to condemn human impudence in the concern of beasts this great author was of opinion that nature for the most part in the corporal form she gave them had only regard to the use of prognostics that were derived thence in his time the defect that hinders communication betwixt them and us why may it not be in our part as well as theirs tis yet to determine where the fault lies that we understand not one another for we understand them no more than they do us and by the same reason they may think us to be beasts as we think them tis no great wonder if we understand not them when we do not understand a basque or a troglodyte and yet some have boasted that they understood them as apollonius tianeus melampus tiresias thales and others and seeing as cosmographers report that there are nations that have a dog for their king they must of necessity be able to interpret his voice and motions we must observe the parity betwixt us have some tolerable apprehension of their meaning and so have beasts of ours much about the same they caress us threaten us and beg of us and we do the same to them as to the rest we manifestly discover that they have a full and absolute communication amongst themselves and that they perfectly understand one another not only those of the same but of diverse kinds the tamer herds and wilder sort of brutes though we of higher race conclude them mutes yet utter dissonant and various notes from gentler lungs or more distended throats as fear or grief or anger do them move or as they do approach the joys of love in one kind of barking of a dog the horse knows there is anger of another sort of bark he is not afraid even in the very beasts that have no voice at all we easily conclude from the society of offices we observe amongst them some other sort of communication their very motions discover it as infants who for want of words devise expressive motions with their hands and eyes and why not as well as our dumb people dispute argue and tell stories by signs of whom i have seen some by practice so clever and active that way that in fact they wanted nothing of the perfection of making themselves understood lovers are angry reconciled entreat thank appoint and in short speak all things by their eyes even silence in a lover love and passion can discover what with the hands we require promise call dismiss threaten pray supplicate deny refuse interrogate admire number confess repent fear express confusion doubt instruct command incite encourage swear 
testify, accuse, condemn, absolve, abuse, despise, defy, provoke, flatter, applaud, bless, submit, mock, reconcile, recommend, exalt, entertain, congratulate, complain, grieve, despair, wonder, exclaim, and what not. And all this with a variety and multiplication, even emulating speech. With the head we invite, remand, confess, deny, give the lie, welcome, honor, reverence, disdain, demand, rejoice, lament, reject, caress, rebuke, submit, huff, encourage, threaten, assure, and inquire. What with the eyebrows? What with the shoulders? There is not a motion that does not speak, and in an intelligible language, without discipline, and a public language that every one understands. Whence it should follow the variety and use distinguished from others considered, that these should rather be judged the property of human nature. I omit what necessity particularly does suddenly suggest to those who are in need. The alphabets upon the fingers, grammars in gesture, and the sciences which are only by them exercised and expressed. And the nations that Pliny reports have no other language. An ambassador of the city of Abdera, after a long conference with Aegis, king of Sparta, demanded of him, Well, sir, what answer must I return to my fellow citizens? That I have given thee leave, said he, to say what thou wouldest, and as much as thou wouldest, without ever speaking a word. Is not this a silent speaking, and very easy to be understood? As to the rest, what is there in us that we do not see in the operations of animals? Is there a polity better ordered, the offices better distributed, and more inviolably observed and maintained than that of bees. Can we imagine that such and so regular a distribution of employments can be carried on without reasoning and deliberation? Hence to the bee some sages have assigned some portion of the god and heavenly wind. The swallows that we see at the return of the spring searching all the corners of our houses for the most commodious places wherein to build their nest. Do they seek without judgment, and amongst a thousand choose out the most proper for their purpose without discretion? And in that elegant and admirable contexture of their buildings, can birds rather make choice of a square figure than a round, of an obtuse than of a right angle, without knowing their properties and effects? Do they bring water and then clay, without knowing that the hardness of the latter grows softer by being wetted? Do they mat their palace with moss or down, without foreseeing that their tender young will lie more safe and easy? Do they secure themselves from the wet and rainy winds, and place their lodgings against the east, without knowing the different qualities of the winds, and considering that one is more wholesome than another? Why does the spider make her web tighter in one place and slacker in another? Why now make one sort of knot and then another, if she has not deliberation thought, and conclusion. We sufficiently discover in most of their works how much animals excel us, and how unable our art is to imitate them. We see, nevertheless, in our rougher performances, 
that we employ all our faculties and apply the utmost power of our souls, why do we not conclude the same of them? Why should we attribute to I know not what natural and servile inclination the works that excel all we can do by nature and art, wherein, without being aware, we give them a mighty advantage over us in making nature, with maternal gentleness and love, accompany and learn them, as it were, by the hand to all the actions and commodities of their life, whilst she leaves us to chance and fortune, and to seek out by art the things that are necessary to our conservation, at the same time denying us the means of being able, by any instruction or effort of understanding, to arrive at the natural sufficiency of beasts, so that their brutish stupidity surpasses, in all conveniences, all that our divine intelligence can do. Really, at this rate, we might with great reason call her an unjust stepmother. But it is nothing so. Our polity is not so irregular and unformed. Nature has universally cared for all her creatures, and there is not one she has not amply furnished with all means necessary for the conservation of its being. For the common complaints I hear men make, as the license of their opinions, one while lifts them up above the clouds, and then again depresses them to the antipodes, that we are the only animal abandoned naked upon the bare earth, tied and bound, not having wherewithal to arm and clothe us but by the spoil of others, whereas nature has covered all other creatures either with shells, husks, bark, hair, wool, prickles, leather, down, feathers, scales, or silk, according to the necessities of their being, has armed them with talons, teeth, or horns, wherewith to assault and defend, and has herself taught them that which is most proper for them, to swim, to run, to fly, and sing, whereas man neither knows how to walk, speak, eat, or do anything but weep without teaching. Like to the wretched mariner when tossed by raging seas upon the desert coast, the tender babe lies naked on the earth, of all supports of life stripped by his birth. When nature first presents him to the day, freed from the cell wherein before he lay, he fills the ambient air with doleful cries, foretelling thus life's future miseries. But beasts, both wild and tame, greater and less, do of themselves in strength and bulk increase. They need no rattle nor the broken chat, I which the nurse first teaches boys to prate. They look not out for different robes to wear, according to the seasons of the year, and need no arms nor walls their goods to save, since earth and liberal nature ever have, and will, in all abundance, still produce, all things whereof they can have need or use. These complaints are false. There is, in the polity of the world, a greater equality and more uniform relation. Our skins are as sufficient to defend us from the injuries of the weather as theirs are. Witness several nations that yet know not the use of clothes. Our ancient Gauls were but slenderly clad any more than the Irish, our neighbors, though in so cold a climate but we may better judge of this by ourselves. For all those parts that we are pleased to expose to the air are found very able to endure it. 
the face, the feet, the hands, the arms, the head, according to the various habit. If there be a tender part about us, and that would seem to be in danger from cold, it should be the stomach where the digestion is. And yet our forefathers were there always open, and our ladies, as tender and delicate as they are, go sometimes half bare, as low as the navel. Neither is the binding or swathing of infants any more necessary, and the Lacedaemonian mothers brought theirs in all liberty of motion of members without any ligature at all. Our crying is common with the greatest part of other animals, and there are but few creatures that are not observed to groan and bemoan themselves a long time after they come into the world, forasmuch as it is a behavior suitable to the weakness wherein they find themselves. As to the custom of eating, it is in us, as in them, natural and without instruction. For every one soon finds his natural force, which he or better may employ or worse. Who doubts but an infant arrived to the strength of feeding himself may make shift to find something to eat and the earth produces and offers him wherewithal to supply his necessity without other culture and artifice and if not at all times no more does she do it to beasts witness the provision we see ants and other creatures hoard up against the dead seasons of the year. The late discovered nations, so abundantly furnished with natural meat and drink, without care or without cookery, may give us to understand that bread is not our only food, and that, without tillage, our mother nature has provided us sufficiently of all we stand in need of. Nay, it appears more fully and plentifully than she does at present, now that we have added our own industry. The earth did first spontaneously afford choice fruits and wines to furnish out the board, with herbs and flowers unsown in verdant fields, but scarce by art so good a harvest yields. Though men and oxen mutually have strove with all their utmost force the soil to improve. The debauchery and irregularity of our appetites outstrips all the inventions we can contrive to satisfy it. As to arms, we have more natural ones than, than most other animals, more various motions of limbs, and naturally and without lesson extract more service from them. Those that are trained to fight naked are seen to throw themselves into the like hazards that we do. If some beasts surpass us in this advantage, we surpass many others. And the industry of fortifying the body and covering it by acquired means, we have by instinct and natural precept. That it is so, the elephant shows who sharpens and whets the teeth he makes use of in war, for he has particular ones for that service which he spares, and never employs them at all to any other use. When bulls go to fight, they toss and throw the dust about them, boars whet their tusks, and the ichneumon, when he is about to engage with the crocodile, fortifies his body, and covers and crusts it all over with close-wrought and well-tempered slime, as with a cuirass. Why shall we not say that it is also natural for us to arm ourselves with wood and iron? As to speech, it is certain that if it be not natural, it is not necessary. Nevertheless, 
i believe that a child which had been brought up in an absolute solitude remote from all society of men which would be an experiment very hard to make would have some kind of speech to express his meaning by and tis not to be supposed that nature should have denied that to us which she has given to several other animals for what is this faculty we observe in them of complaining rejoicing calling to one another for succor and inviting each other to love which they do with the voice other than speech and why should they not speak to one another they speak to us and we to them in how many several sorts of ways do we speak to our dogs and they answer us we converse with them in another sort of language and use other appellations than we do with birds hogs oxen horses and alter the idiom according to the kind thus from one swarm of ants some sally out to spy another's stock or mark its route lactantius seems to attribute to beasts not only speech but laughter also and the difference of language which is seen amongst us according to the difference of countries is also observed in animals of the same kind aristotle in proof of this instances the various calls of partridges according to the situation of places and various birds do from their warbling throats at various times utter quite different notes and some their hoarse songs with the seasons change but it is yet to be known what language this child would speak and of that what is said by guess has no great appearance if a man will allege to me in opposition to this opinion that those who are naturally deaf speak not i answer that this is not only because they could not receive the instruction of speaking by ear but rather because the sense of hearing of which they are deprived relates to that of speaking and that these hold together by a natural and inseparable tie in such manner that what we speak we must first speak to ourselves within and make it sound in our own ears before we can utter it to others all this i have said to prove the resemblance there is in human things and to bring us back and join us to the crowd we are neither above nor below the rest all that is under heaven says the sage runs one law and one fortune all things remain bound and entangled in one fatal chain there is indeed some difference there are several orders and degrees but it is under the aspect of one and the same nature all things by their own rights proceed and draw towards their ends by nature's certain law man must be compelled and restrained within the bounds of this polity miserable creature he is not in a condition really to step over the rail he is fettered and circumscribed he is subjected to the same necessity that the other creatures of his rank and order are and of a very mean condition without any prerogative of true and real preeminence that which he attributes to himself by vain fancy and opinion has neither body nor taste and if it be so that he only of all the animals has this liberty of imagination and irregularity of thoughts representing to him that which is that which is not 
and that he would have the false and the true tis an advantage dearly bought and of which he has very little reason to be proud for thence springs the principal and original fountain of all the evils that befall him sin sickness irresolution affliction despair i say then to return to my subject that there is no appearance to induce a man to believe that beasts should by a natural and forced inclination do the same things that we do by our choice and industry we ought from like effects to conclude like faculties and from greater effects greater faculties and consequently confess that the same reasoning and the same ways by which we operate are common with them or that they have others that are better why should we imagine this natural constraint in them who experience no such effect in ourselves added that it is more honorable to be guided and obliged to act regularly by a natural and inevitable condition and nearer allied to the divinity than to act regularly by a temerarious and fortuitous liberty and more safe to entrust the reins of our conduct in the hands of nature than our own the vanity of our presumption makes us prefer rather to owe our sufficiency to our own exertions than to her bounty and to enrich the other animals with natural goods and abjure them in their favor in order to honor and ennoble ourselves with goods acquired very foolishly in my opinion for i should as much value parts and virtues naturally and purely my own as those i had begged and obtained from education it is not in our power to obtain a nobler reputation than to be favored of god and nature for instance take the fox the people of thrace make use of when they wish to pass over the ice of some frozen river and turn him out before them to that purpose when we see him lay his ear upon the bank of the river down to the ice to listen if from a more remote or nearer distance he can hear the noise of the water's current and according as he finds by that the ice to be of a less or greater thickness to retire or advance have we not reason to believe thence that the same rational thoughts passed through his head that we should have upon the like occasions and that it is a ratiocination and consequence drawn from natural sense that that which makes a noise runs that which runs is not frozen what is not frozen is liquid and that which is liquid yields to impression for to attribute this to a mere quickness of the sense of hearing without reason and consequence is a chimera that cannot enter into the imagination we are to suppose the same of the many sorts of subtleties and inventions with which beasts secure themselves from and frustrate the enterprises we plot against them and if we will make an advantage even of this that it is in our power to seize them to employ them in our service and to use them at our pleasure tis still but the same advantage we have over one another we have our slaves upon these terms the climacidae were not they women in syria who squat on all fours served for a ladder or footstool by which the ladies mounted their coaches and the greatest part of free persons surrender for very trivial conveniences their life and being into the power of another 
the wives and concubines of the thracians contended who should be chosen to be slain upon their husband's tomb have tyrants ever failed of finding men enough vowed to their devotion some of them moreover adding this necessity of accompanying them in death as well as life whole armies have bound themselves after this manner to their captains the form of the oath in the rude school of gladiators was in these words we swear to suffer ourselves to be chained burnt wounded and killed with the sword and to endure all that true gladiators suffer from their master religiously engaging both body and soul in his service ure meum civis flamma caput et pete ferro corpus et intorto verbere terga seca wound me with steel or burn my head with fire or scourge my shoulders with well-twisted wire this was an obligation indeed and yet there in one year ten thousand entered into it to their destruction when the scythians interred their king they strangled upon his body the most beloved of his concubines his cup-bearer the master of his horse his chamberlain the usher of his chamber and his cook and upon the anniversary thereof they killed fifty horses mounted by fifty pages that they had impaled all up the spine of the back to the throat and there left them fixed in triumph about his tomb the men that serve us do it cheaper and for a less careful and favorable usage than what we treat our hawks horses and dogs withal to what solicitude do we not submit for the conveniences of these i do not think that servants of the most abject condition would willingly do that for their masters that princes think it an honor to do for their beasts diogenes seeing his relations solicitous to redeem him from servitude they are fools said he tis he that keeps and nourishes me that in reality serves me and they who entertain beasts ought rather to be said to serve them than to be served by them and withal in this these have something more generous in that one lion never submitted to another lion nor one horse to another for want of courage as we go to the chase of beasts so do tigers and lions to the chase of men and do the same execution upon one another dogs upon hares pikes upon tench swallows upon grasshoppers and sparrow-hawks upon blackbirds and larks the stork with snakes and lizards from the wood and pathless wilds supports her callow brood while jove's own eagle bird of noble blood scours the wide country for undaunted food sweeps the swift hare or swifter fawn away and feeds her nestlings with the generous prey we divide the quarry as well as the pains and labor of the chase with our hawks and hounds and about amphipolis in thrace the hawkers and wild falcons equally divide the prey in the half as also along the lake meotis if the fisherman does not honestly leave the wolves an equal share of what he has caught they presently go and tear his nets in pieces and as we have a way of sporting that is carried on more by subtlety than force as springing hares and angling with line and hook there is also the like amongst other animals aristotle says that the cuttlefish casts a gut out of her throat 
as long as a line, which she extends and draws back at pleasure. And as she perceives some little fish approach her, she lets it nibble upon the end of this gut, lying herself concealed in the sand or mud, and by little and little draws it in, till the little fish is so near her that at one spring she may catch it. As to strength, there is no creature in the world exposed to so many injuries as man. We need not a whale, elephant, or a crocodile, nor any such like animals, of which one alone is sufficient to dispatch a great number of men to do our business. Lice are sufficient to vacate Scylla's dictatorship, and the heart and life of a great and triumphant emperor is the breakfast of a little contemptible worm. Why should we say that it is only for man, or knowledge built up by art and meditation, to distinguish the things useful for his being and proper for the cure of his diseases, and those which are not, to know the virtues of rhubarb and polypody. When we see the goats of Candia, when wounded with an arrow, among a million of plants, choose out dittany for their cure, and the tortoise, when she has eaten a viper, immediately go out to look for oreganum to purge her, the dragon to rub and clear his eyes with fennel, the storks to give themselves clysters of sea-water, the elephants to draw not only out of their own bodies and those of their companions, but out of the bodies of their masters too, witness the elephant of King Porus whom Alexander defeated, the darts and javelins thrown at them in battle, and that so dexterously that we ourselves could not do it with so little pain to the patient. Why do we not say here also that this is knowledge and reason? For to allege to their disparagement that tis by the sole instruction and dictate of nature that they know all this, is not to take from them the dignity of knowledge and reason, but with greater force to attribute it to them than to us, for the honour of so infallible a mistress. Chrysippus, though in other things as scornful a judge of the condition of animals as any other philosopher whatever, considering the motions of a dog, who coming to a place where three ways meet, either to hunt after his master he has lost, or in pursuit of some game that flies before him, goes snuffing first in one of the ways, and then in another, and, after having made himself sure of two, without finding the trace of what he seeks, dashes into the third without examination, is forced to confess that this reasoning is in the dog. I have traced my master to this place. He must of necessity be gone one of these three ways. He is not gone this way, nor that. He must then infallibly be gone this other. And that assuring himself by this conclusion, he makes no use of his nose in the third way, nor ever lays it to the ground but suffers himself to be carried on there by the force of reason. This sally, purely logical, and this use of propositions divided and conjoined, and the right enumeration of parts, is it not every whit as good that the dog knows all this of himself as well as from Trapezuntius? Animals are not incapable, however, of being instructed after our method. We teach blackbirds, ravens, pies, and parrots to speak, and the facility wherewith we see they lend us their voices, 
and render both them and their breath so supple and pliant to be formed and confined within a certain number of letters and syllables does evince that they have a reason within which renders them so docile and willing to learn everybody i believe is glutted with the several sorts of tricks that tumblers teach their dogs the dances where they do not miss any one cadence of the sound they hear the several various motions and leaps they make them perform by the command of a word but i observe this effect with the greatest admiration which nevertheless is very common in the dogs that lead the blind both in the country and in cities i have taken notice how they stop at certain doors where they are wont to receive alms how they avoid the encounter of coaches and carts even there where they have sufficient room to pass i have seen them by the trench of a town forsake a plain and even path and take a worse only to keep their masters further from the ditch how could a man have made this dog understand that it was his office to look to his master's safety only and to despise his own conveniency to serve him and how had he the knowledge that a way was wide enough for him that was not so for a blind man can all this be apprehended without ratiocination i must not omit what plutarch says he saw of a dog at rome with the emperor vespasian the father at the theatre of marcellus this dog served a player that played a farce of several parts and personages and had therein his part he had amongst other things to counterfeit himself for some time dead by reason of a certain drug he was supposed to eat after he had swallowed a piece of bread which passed for the drug he began after a while to tremble and stagger as if he was taken giddy at last stretching himself out stiff as if dead he suffered himself to be drawn and dragged from place to place as it was his part to do and afterward when he knew it to be time he began first gently to stir as if awaking out of a profound sleep and lifting up his head looked about him after such a manner as astonished all the spectators the oxen that served in the royal gardens of susa to water them and turn certain great wheels to draw water for that purpose to which buckets were fastened such as there are many in languedoc being ordered every one to draw a hundred turns a day they were so accustomed to this number that it was impossible by any force to make them draw one turn more but their task being performed they would suddenly stop and stand still we are almost men before we can count a hundred and have lately discovered nations that have no knowledge of numbers at all there is more understanding required in the teaching of others than in being taught now setting aside what democritus held and proved that most of the arts we have were taught us by other animals as by the spider to weave and sew by the swallow to build by the swan and nightingale music and by several animals to make medicines aristotle is of opinion that the nightingales teach their young ones to sing and spend a great deal of time and care in it whence it happens that those we bring up in cages and which have not had the time to learn of their parents want much of the grace of their singing we may judge by this that they improve by discipline and study and 
even amongst the wild it is not all and every one alike every one has learnt to do better or worse according to their capacity and so jealous are they one of another whilst learning that they contention with emulation and by so vigorous a contention that sometimes the vanquished fall dead upon the place the breath rather failing than the voice the younger ruminate pensively and begin to mutter some broken notes the disciple listens to the master's lesson and gives the best account he is able they are silent by turns one may hear faults corrected and observe some reprehensions of the teacher i have formerly seen says arian an elephant having a symbol hung at each leg and another fastened to his trunk at the sound of which all the others danced round about him rising and bending at certain cadences as they were guided by the instrument and twas delightful to hear this harmony in the spectacles of rome there were ordinarily seen elephants taught to move and dance to the sound of the voice dances wherein were several changes and cadences very hard to learn and some have been known so intent upon their lesson as privately to practice it by themselves that they might not be chidden nor beaten by their masters but this other story of the pie of which we have plutarch himself for a warrant is very strange she lived in a barber's shop at rome and did wonders in imitating with her voice whatever she heard it happened one day that certain trumpeters stood a good while sounding before the shop after that and all the next day the pie was pensive dumb and melancholic which everybody wondered at and thought the noise of the trumpets had so stupefied and astonished her that her voice was gone with her hearing but they found at last that it was a profound meditation and a retiring into herself her thoughts exercising and preparing her voice to imitate the sound of those trumpets so that the first voice she uttered was perfectly to imitate their strains stops and changes having by this new lesson quitted and taken in disdain all she had learned before I will not omit this other example of a dog, also, which the same Plutarch. I am sadly confounding all order, but I do not propose arrangement here any more than elsewhere throughout my book, which Plutarch says he saw on board a ship, this dog being puzzled how to get the oil that was in the bottom of a jar which he could not reach with his tongue by reason of the narrow mouth of the vessel went and fetched stones and let them fall into the jar till he made the oil rise so high that he could reach it what is this but an effect of a very subtle capacity tis said that the ravens of barbary do the same when the water they would drink is too low this action is somewhat akin to what juba a king of their nation relates of the elephants that when by the craft of the hunter one of them is trapped in certain deep pits prepared for them and covered over with brush to deceive them all the rest in great diligence bring a great many stones and logs of wood to raise the bottom so that he may get out but this animal in several other effects comes so near to human capacity that should i particularly relate all that experience hath delivered to us i should easily have what i usually maintain granted namely that there is more difference betwixt such and such a man than betwixt such a beast and such a man the keeper of an elephant 
in a private house of Syria robbed him every meal of the half of his allowance. One day his master would himself feed him and poured the full measure of barley he had ordered for his allowance into his manger which the elephant casting an angry look at the keeper with his trunk separated the one half from the other and thrust it aside by that declaring the wrong was done him and another having a keeper that mixed stones with his corn to make up the measure came to the pot where he was boiling meat for his own dinner and filled it with ashes these are particular effects but that which all the world has seen and all the world knows that in all the armies of the levant one of the greatest force consisted in elephants with whom they did without comparison much greater execution than we now do with our artillery which takes pretty nearly their place in a day of battle as may easily be supposed by such as are well read in ancient history the sires of these huge animals were wont the carthaginian hannibal to mount our leaders also did these beasts bestride and mounted thus pyrrhus his foes defied nay more upon their backs they used to bear castles with armed cohorts to the war they must necessarily have very confidently relied upon the fidelity and understanding of these beasts when they entrusted them with the vanguard of a battle where the least stop they should have made by reason of the bulk and heaviness of their bodies and the least fright that should have made them face about upon their own people had been enough to spoil all and there are but few examples where it has happened that they have fallen foul upon their own troops whereas we ourselves break into our own battalions and rout one another they had the charge not of one simple movement only but of many several things to be performed in the battle as the spaniards did to their dogs in their new conquest of the indies to whom they gave pay and allowed them a share in the spoil and those animals showed as much dexterity and judgment in pursuing the victory and stopping the pursuit in charging and retiring as occasion required and in distinguishing their friends from their enemies as they did ardor and fierceness we more admire and value things that are unusual and strange than those of ordinary observation i had not else so long insisted upon these examples for i believe whoever shall strictly observe what we ordinarily see in those animals we have amongst us may there find as wonderful effects as those we seek in remote countries and ages tis one and the same nature that rolls on her course and whoever has sufficiently considered the present state of things might certainly conclude as to both the future and the past i have formerly seen men brought hither by sea from very distant countries whose language not being understood by us and moreover their mean countenance and habit being quite differing from ours which of us did not repute them savages and brutes who did not attribute it to stupidity and want of common sense to see them mute ignorant of the french tongue ignorant of our salutations and cringes our port and behavior from which all human nature must by all means take its pattern and example all that seems strange to us and that we do not understand we condemn the same thing happens also in the judgments we make of beasts 
they have several conditions like to ours from those we may by comparison draw some conjecture but by those qualities that are particular to themselves what know we what to make of them the horses dogs oxen sheep birds and most of the animals that live amongst us know our voices and suffer themselves to be governed by them so did crassus's lamprey and came when he called it as also do the eels that are found in the lake arethusia and i have seen several ponds where the fishes come to eat at a certain call of those who use to feed them they every one have names and one and all straightway appear at their own master's call we may judge of that we may also say that the elephants have some participation of religion forasmuch as after several washings and purifications they are observed to lift up their trunk like arms and fixing their eyes towards the rising of the sun continue long in meditation and contemplation at certain hours of the days of their own motion without instruction or precept but because we do not see any such signs in other animals we cannot for that conclude that they are without religion nor make any judgment of what is concealed from us as we discern something in this action which the philosopher cleanthes took notice of because it something resembles our own he saw he says ants go from their ant hill carrying the dead body of an ant towards another ant hill whence several other ants came out to meet them as if to speak with them where after having been a while together the last returned to consult you may suppose with their fellow citizens and so made two or three journeys by reason of the difficulty of capitulation in the conclusion the last comers brought the first a worm out of their burrow as it were for the ransom of the defunct which the first laid upon their backs and carried home leaving the dead body to the others this was the interpretation that cleanthes gave of this transaction giving us by that to understand that those creatures that have no voice are not nevertheless without intercourse and mutual communication whereof tis through our own defect that we do not participate and for that reason foolishly take upon us to pass our censure but they yet produce either effects far beyond our capacity to which we are so far from being able to arrive by imitation that we cannot so much as by imitation conceive it many are of opinion that in the great and last naval engagement that antony lost to augustus his admiral galley was stayed in the middle of her course by the little fish the latins call remora by reason of the property she has of staying all sorts of vessels to which she fastens herself and the emperor caligula sailing with a great navy upon the coast of romania his galley only was suddenly stayed by the same fish which he caused to be taken fastened as it was to the keel of his ship very angry that such a little animal could resist both the sea the wind and the force of all his oars by being only fastened by the beak to his galley for it is a shellfish and was moreover not without great reason astonished that being brought to him in the vessel it had no longer the strength it had without a citizen of cusicus formerly acquired the reputation of a good mathematician for having learnt the quality of the hedgehog he has his burrow open in divers places and to several winds 
and foreseeing the wind that is to come stops the hole on that side which that citizen observing gave the city certain predictions of the wind which was presently to blow the chameleon takes her color from the place upon which she is laid but the polypus gives himself what color he pleases according to occasion either to conceal himself from what he fears or from what he has a design to seize in the chameleon tis a passive but in the polypus tis an active change we have some changes of color as in fear anger shame and other passions that alter our complexions but it is by the effect of suffering as with the chameleon it is in the power of the jaundice indeed to make us turn yellow but tis not in the power of our own will now these effects that we discover in other animals much greater than ours seem to imply some more excellent faculty in them unknown to us as tis to be presumed there are several other qualities and abilities of theirs of which no appearances have arrived at us end of section 42 section 43 of essays book 2 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by cynthia moyer essays book 2 by michel de montaigne translated by charles cotton apology for raymond sebon part three amongst all the predictions of elder times the most ancient and the most certain were those taken from the flight of birds we have nothing certain like it nor anything to be so much admired that rule and order of the moving of the wing whence they derived the consequences of future things must of necessity be guided by some excellent means to so noble an operation for to attribute this great effect to any natural disposition without the intelligence consent and meditation of him by whom it is produced is an opinion evidently false that it is so the cramp fish has this quality not only to benumb all the members that touch her but even through the nets transmit a heavy dullness into the hands of those that move and handle them nay it is further said that if one pour water upon her he will feel this numbness mount up the water to the hand and stupefy the feeling through the water this is a miraculous force but tis not useless to the cramp fish she knows it and makes use on it for to catch the prey she desires she will bury herself in the mud that other fishes swimming over her struck and benumbed with this coldness of hers may fall into her power cranes swallows and other birds of passage by shifting their abode according to the seasons sufficiently manifest the knowledge they have of their divining faculty and put it in use huntsmen assure us that to cull out from amongst a great many puppies that which ought to be preserved as the best the best way is to refer the choice to the mother as thus take them and carry them out of the kennel and the first she brings back will certainly be the best or 
if you make a show as if you would environ the kennel with fire, that one she first catches up to save. By which it appears they have a sort of prognostic which we have not, or that they have some virtue in judging of their whelps other and more certain than we have. The manner of coming into the world, of engendering, nourishing, acting, moving, living and dying of beasts, is so near to ours that whatever we retrench from their moving causes and add to our own condition above theirs, can by no means proceed from any meditation of our own reason. For the regimen of our health, physicians propose to us the example of the beast's manners and way of living. For this saying, out of Plutarch, has in all times been in the mouth of these people, keep warm thy feet and head, as to the rest, live like a beast. The chief of all natural actions is generation. We have a certain disposition of members which is the most proper for us to that end. Nevertheless, we are ordered by Lucretius to conform to the gesture and posture of the brutes as the most effectual. More ferarum, quadrupedumque magis ritu, plerumque putantur, concipere uxores. Quia sit loca sumere possunt, pectoribus positis, sublatis semina lumbis. And the same authority condemns, as hurtful, those indiscreet and impudent motions which the women have added of their own invention, to whom it proposes the more temperate and modest pattern and practice of the beasts of their own sex. Nam mulier prohibet se concipere atque repugnat, clonibus ipsa viri venerem si laeta retractet, atque exosato ciet omni pectore fluctus, eicit enim sulci recta regioni viaque vomerem, atque locis avertit seminis ictum. If it be justice to render to every one their due, the beasts that serve, love, and defend their benefactors, and that pursue and fall upon strangers and those who offend them, do in this represent a certain air of our justice, as also in observing a very equitable equality in the distribution of what they have to their young and as to friendship, they have it without comparison more lively and constant than men have. King Lysimachus's dog, Hyrcanus, master being dead, lay on his bed, obstinately refusing either to eat or drink, and the day that his body was burnt, he took a run and leaped into the fire, where he was consumed as also did the dog of one Pyrrhus, for he would not stir from off his master's bed from the time he died. And when they carried him away, let himself be carried with him, and, at last, leaped into the pile where they burnt his master's body. There are inclinations of affection which sometimes spring in us without the consultation of reason, and by a fortuitous temerity, which others call sympathy, of which beasts are as capable as we. We see horses take such an acquaintance with one another that we have much ado to make them eat or travel when separated. We observe them to fancy a particular color in those of their own kind, and where they meet it, run to it with great joy and demonstrations of good will, and have a dislike and hatred for some other color. 
animals have choice as well as we in their amours and call out their mistresses neither are they exempt from our jealousies and implacable malice desires are either natural and necessary as to eat and drink or natural and not necessary as the coupling with females or neither natural nor necessary of which last sort are almost all the desires of men they are all superfluous and artificial for tis marvellous how little will satisfy nature how little she has left us to desire our ragouts and kickshaws are not of her ordering the stoics say that a man may live on an olive a day the delicacy of our wines is no part of her instruction nor the refinements we introduce into the indulgence of our amorous appetites neque ille magno prognatum deposcit consule conum nature in her pursuit of love disclaims the pride of titles and the pomp of names these irregular desires that the ignorance of good and a false opinion have infused into us are so many that they almost exclude all the natural just as if there were so great a number of strangers in the city as to thrust out the natural inhabitants or usurping upon their ancient rights and privileges should extinguish their authority and introduce new laws and customs of their own animals are much more regular than we and keep themselves with greater moderation within the limits nature has prescribed but yet not so exactly that they have not sometimes an analogy with our debauches and as there have been furious desires that have impelled men to the love of beasts so there have been examples of beasts that have fallen in love with us and been seized with monstrous affection betwixt kinds witness the elephant who was rival to aristophanes the grammarian in the love of a young herb wench in the city of alexandria who was nothing behind him in all the offices of a very passionate suitor for going through the market where they sold fruit he would take some in his trunk and carry them to her he would as much as possible keep her always in his sight and would sometimes put his trunk under her handkerchief into her bosom to feel her breasts they tell also of a dragon in love with a girl and of a goose enamoured of a child of a ram that was suitor to the minstrelous glaucia in the town of asopus and we see not unfrequently baboons furiously in love with women we see also certain male animals that are fond of the males of their own kind opian and others give us some examples of the reverence that beasts have to their kindred in their copulations but experience often shows us the contrary nec habetur turpe juvencae fere patrem tergo fit equo sua filia conux quasque creavit in it pecudes caper ipsaque cuius semine concepta est ex illo concipit ales the heifer thinks it not a shame to take her lusty sire upon her willing back the horse his daughter leaps goats scruple not to increase the herd by those they have begot and birds of all sorts do in common live and by the seed they have conceived conceive 
and for subtle cunning can there be a more pregnant example than in the philosopher thales's mule who fording a river laden with salt and by accident stumbling there so that the sacks he carried were all wet perceiving that by the melting of the salt his burden was something lighter he never failed so oft as he came to any river to lie down with his load till his master discovering the knavery ordered that he should be laden with wood wherein finding himself mistaken he ceased to practice that device there are several that very vividly represent the true image of our avarice for we see them infinitely solicit us to get all they can and hide it with that exceeding great care though they never make any use of it at all as to thrift they surpass us not only in the foresight and laying up and saving for the time to come but they have moreover a great deal of the science necessary thereto the ants bring abroad into the sun their grain and seed to air refresh and dry them when they perceive them to mould and grow musty lest they should decay and rot but the caution and prevention they use in gnawing their grains of wheat surpass all imagination of human prudence for by reason that the wheat does not always continue sound and dry but grows soft thaws and dissolves as if it were steeped in milk whilst hasting to germination for fear lest it should shoot and lose the nature and property of a magazine for their subsistence they nibble off the end by which it should shoot and sprout as to what concerns war which is the greatest and most magnificent of human actions i would very fain know whether we would use it for an argument of some prerogative or on contrary for a testimony of our weakness and imperfection as in truth the science of undoing and killing one another and of ruining and destroying our own kind has nothing in it so tempting as to make it be coveted by beasts who have it not quando leoni fortior erripuit vitam leo quo nemore unquam expiravit a per maioris dentibus apri no lion drinks a weaker lion's gore no boar expires beneath a stronger boar yet are they not universally exempt witness the furious encounters of bees and the enterprises of the princes of the contrary armies saepe duobus regibus incessit magno discordia motu continuoque animus vulgi et trepidantia bello gorda licet longe praesciscere but if contending factions arm the hive when rival kings in doubtful battle strive tumultuous crowds the dread event prepare and palpitating hearts that beat to war i never read this divine description but that methinks i there see human folly and vanity represented in their true and lively colours for these warlike movements that so ravish us with their astounding noise and horror this rattle of guns drums and cries fulgur ibi ad celum se tolit totaque circum aere renidescit tellus subterque virum vi excitur pedibus sonitus clamoreque montes ictirectant voces ad sidera mundi when burnished arms to heaven dart their rays and many a steely beam in the sunlight plays 
when trampled is the earth by horse and man until the very centre groans again and that the rocks struck by the various cries reverberate the sound unto the skies in the dreadful embattling of so many thousands of armed men and so great fury ardor and courage tis pleasant to consider by what idle occasions they are excited and by how light ones appeased paridis propter narratur amorem grecia barbariae diro colisa duello of wanton paris the illicit love did greece and troy to ten years warfare move all asia was ruined and destroyed for the lust of paris the envy of one single man a despite a pleasure a domestic jealousy causes that ought not to set two oyster wenches by the ears is the mover of all this mighty bustle shall we believe those very men who are themselves the principal authors of these mischiefs let us then hear the greatest the most powerful the most victorious emperor that ever was turning into a jest very pleasantly and ingeniously several battles fought both by sea and land the blood and lives of five hundred thousand men that followed his fortune and the strength and riches of two parts of the world drained for the expense of his expeditions quod futuit glafiran antonius hanc mihi poenam fulvia constituit se quoque uti futuam fulviam ego ut futuam quid si me manius oret paedicem faciam non puto si sapiam aut futue aut pugnemus ait quid si mihi vita carior est ipsa mentula signa canant qui moi que je serve fulvi suffit-il qu'elle en est en vie à ses comptes on verrait se retire pour moi mais l'épouse mal satisfaite et moi me dit-elle ou combattant mais quoi elle est bien lade allons sans trompette cosanthony is fired with glafira's charms fain would his fulvia tempt me to her arms if anthony be false what then must i be slave to fulvia's lustful tyranny then would a thousand wanton waspish wives i use my latin with the liberty of conscience you are pleased to allow me now this great body with so many fronts and so many motions which seems to threaten heaven and earth quam multi libico volvuntur marmore fluctus saevus ubi orion hibernis conditur undis vel cum solenovo densae torentur aristae aut hermicampo aut luciae flaventibus arvis scuta sonant pulsuque pedum tremit excita tellus not thicker billows beat the libyan main when pale orion sits in wintry rain nor thicker harvests on rich hermus rise or lycian fields when phoebus burns the skies then stand these troops their bucklers ring around their trampling turns the turf and shakes the solid ground this furious monster with so many heads and arms is yet man feeble calamitous and miserable man tis but an ant hill disturbed and provoked it nigrum campis agmen the black troop marches to the field a contrary blast 
the croaking of a flight of ravens, the stumble of a horse, the casual passage of an eagle, a dream, a voice, a sign, a morning mist, are any one of them sufficient to beat down and overturn him. Dart but a sunbeam in his face, he is melted and vanished. Blow but a little dust in his eyes, as our poet says of the bees, and all our ensigns and legions, with the great Pompey himself at the head of them, are routed and crushed to pieces. For it was he, as I take it, that Sertorius beat in Spain with those fine arms which also served Eumenes against Antigonus, and Serena against Crassus. Swarm to my bed like bees into their hives. Declare for love or war, she said, and frowned. No love I'll grant. To arms bid trumpets sound. He motus animorum atque haec certamine tanta, pulveris exigui actu compressa quiescent. Yet at thy will these dreadful conflicts cease, throw but a little dust, and all is peace. Let us but slip our flies after them, and they will have the force and courage to defeat them of fresh memory, the Portuguese having besieged the city of Tamley, in the territory of Ziatin, the inhabitants of the place brought a great many hives, of which are great plenty in that place, upon the wall, and with fire drove the bees so furiously upon the enemy that they gave over the enterprise, not being able to stand their attacks and endure their stings. And so the citizens, by this new sort of relief, gained liberty and the victory with so wonderful a fortune, that at the return of their defenders from the battle, they found they had not lost so much as one. The souls of emperors and cobblers are cast in the same mould. The weight and importance of the actions of princes considered, we persuade ourselves that they must be produced by some as weighty and important causes. But we are deceived, for they are pushed on and pulled back in their motions by the same springs that we are in our little undertakings. The same reason that makes us wrangle with a neighbor causes a war betwixt princes. The same reason that makes us whip a lackey, falling into the hands of a king, makes him ruin a whole province. They are as lightly moved as we, but they are able to do more. In a gnat and an elephant, the passion is the same. As to fidelity, there is no animal in the world so treacherous as man. Our histories have recorded the violent pursuits that dogs have made after the murderers of their masters. King Pyrrhus, observing a dog that watched a dead man's body, and understanding that he had for three days together performed that office, commanded that the body should be buried, and took the dog along with him. One day, as he was at a general muster of his army, this dog, seeing his master's murderers, with great barking and extreme signs of anger, flew upon them, and by this first accusation awakened the revenge of this murder, which was soon after perfected by form of justice. As much was done by the dog of the wise Hesiod, who convicted the sons of Ganictor of Naupactus of the murder committed on the person of his master. 
another dog being to guard a temple at athens having spied a sacrilegious thief carrying away the finest jewels fell to barking at him with all his force but the warders not awaking at the noise he followed him and day being broke kept off at a little distance without losing sight of him if he offered him anything to eat he would not take it but would wag his tail at all the passengers he met and took whatever they gave him and if the thief laid down to sleep he likewise stayed upon the same place the news of this dog being come to the warders of the temple they put themselves upon the pursuit inquiring of the color of the dog and at last found him in the city of chromion and the thief also whom they brought back to athens where he got his reward and the judges in consideration of this good office ordered a certain measure of corn for the dog's daily sustenance at the public charge and the priests to take care of it plutarch delivers this story for a certain truth and that it happened in the age wherein he lived as to gratitude for i think we need bring this word into a little repute this one example which apion reports himself to have been an eye-witness of shall suffice one day says he at rome they entertained the people with the sight of the fighting of several strange beasts and principally of lions of an unusual size there was one amongst the rest who by his furious deportment by the strength and largeness of his limbs and by his loud and dreadful roaring attracted the eyes of all the spectators amongst other slaves that were presented to the people in this combat of beasts there was one androdus of dacia belonging to a roman lord of consular dignity this lion having seen him at a distance first made a sudden stop as it were in a wandering posture and then softly approached nearer in a gentle and peaceable manner as if it were to enter into acquaintance with him this being done and being now assured of what he sought for he began to wag his tail as dogs do when they flatter their masters and to kiss and lick the hands and thighs of the poor wretch who was beside himself and almost dead with fear androdus being by this kindness of the lion a little come to himself and having taken so much heart as to consider and know him it was a singular pleasure to see the joy and caresses that passed betwixt them at which the people breaking into loud acclamations of joy the emperor caused the slave to be called to know from him the cause of so strange an event who thereupon told him a new and a very strange story my master said he being proconsul in africa i was constrained by his severity and cruel usage being daily beaten to steal from him and run away and to hide myself secretly from a person of so great authority in the province i thought it my best way to fly to the solitudes sands and uninhabitable parts of that country resolving that in case the means of supporting life should chance to fail me to make some shift or other to kill myself the sun being excessively hot at noon and the heat intolerable i lit upon a private and almost inaccessible cave and went into it 
soon after there came in to me this lion with one foot wounded and bloody complaining and groaning with the pain he endured at his coming i was exceeding afraid but he having spied me hid in the corner of his den came gently to me holding out and showing me his wounded foot as if he demanded my assistance in his distress i then drew out a great splinter he had got there and growing a little more familiar with him squeezing the wound thrust out the matter dirt and gravel which was got into it and wiped and cleansed it the best i could he finding himself something better and much eased of his pain laid him down to rest and presently fell asleep with his foot in my hand from that time forward he and i lived together in this cave three whole years upon one and the same diet for of the beasts that he killed in hunting he always brought me the best pieces which i roasted in the sun for want of fire and so ate it at last growing weary of this wild and brutish life the lion being one day gone abroad to hunt for our ordinary provision i departed thence and the third day after was taken by the soldiers who brought me from africa to this city to my master who presently condemned me to die and to be thus exposed to the wild beasts now by what i see this lion was also taken soon after who has now sought to recompense me for the benefit and cure that he received at my hands this is the story that androdus told the emperor which he also conveyed from hand to hand to the people wherefore at the general request he was absolved from his sentence and set at liberty and the lion was by order of the people presented to him we afterwards saw says apion androdus leading this lion in nothing but a small leash from tavern to tavern at rome and receiving what money everybody would give him the lion being so gentle as to suffer himself to be covered with the flowers that the people threw upon him every one that met him saying there goes the lion that entertained the man there goes the man that cured the lion we often lament the loss of beasts we love and so do they the loss of us post bellator equus positis insignibus aeton it lacrimans gotisque humectat grandibus ora to close the pomp aethon the steed of state is led the funeral of his lord to wait stripped of his trappings with a sullen pace he walks and the big tears run rolling down his face as some nations have their wives in common and some others have every one his own is not the same seen among beasts and marriages better kept than ours as to the society and confederation they make amongst themselves to league together and to give one another mutual assistance is it not known that oxen hogs and other animals at the cry of any of their kind that we offend all the herd run to his aid and embody for his defence the fish scarus when he has swallowed the angler's hook his fellows all crowd about him and gnaw the line in pieces and if by chance one be got into the bow net the others present him their tails on the outside which he holding fast with his teeth 
they after that manner disengage and draw him out mullets when one of their companions is engaged cross the line over their back and with a fin they have there indented like a saw cut and saw it asunder as to the particular offices that we receive from one another for the service of life there are several like examples amongst them tis said that the whale never moves that she has not always before her a little fish like the sea gudgeon for this reason called the guide fish whom the whale follows suffering herself to be led and turned with as great facility as the rudder guides the ship in recompense of which service also whereas all the other things whether beast or vessel that enter into the dreadful gulf of this monster's mouth are immediately lost and swallowed up this little fish retires into it in great security and there sleeps during which time the whale never stirs but so soon as ever it goes out she immediately follows it and if by accident she loses the sight of her little guide she goes wandering here and there and strikes her sides against the rocks like a ship that has lost her helm which plutarch affirms to have seen in the island of antiquira there is a like society betwixt the little bird called the wren and the crocodile the wren serves for a sentinel over this great animal and if the ichneumon his mortal enemy approach to fight him this little bird for fear lest he should surprise him asleep both with his voice and bill rouses him and gives him notice of his danger he feeds of this monster's leavings who receives him familiarly into his mouth suffering him to peck in his jaws and betwixt his teeth and thence to pick out the bits of flesh that remain and when he has a mind to shut his mouth he first gives the bird warning to go out by closing it by little and little and without bruising or doing it any harm at all the shellfish called the nacre lives in the same intelligence with the shrimp a little sort of animal of the lobster kind which serves her in the nature of a porter sitting at the opening of the shell which the nacre keeps always gaping and open till the shrimp sees some little fish proper for their prey within the hollow of the shell where she enters too and pinches the nacre so to the quick that she is forced to close her shell where they two together devour the prey they have trapped in their fort in the manner of living of the tunnies we observe a singular knowledge of the three parts of mathematics as to astrology they teach it men for they stay in the place where they are surprised by the brumal solstice and never stir thence till the next equinox for which reason aristotle himself attributes to them this science as to geometry and arithmetic they always form their numbers in the figure of a cube every way square and make up the body of a battalion solid close and environed round with six equal sides and swim in this square order as large behind as before so that whoever in seeing them can count one rank may easily number the whole troop by reason that the depth is equal to the breadth and the breadth to the length as to magnanimity it will be hard to exhibit a better instance of it than in the example of the great dog sent to alexander the great from the indies they first brought him a stag to encounter 
next a boar, and after that a bear, all which he slighted and disdained to stir from his place. But when he saw a lion, he then immediately roused himself, evidently manifesting that he declared that alone worthy to enter the lists with him. Touching repentance and the acknowledgment of faults, tis reported of an elephant that, having in the impetuosity of his rage killed his keeper, he fell into so extreme a sorrow that he would never after eat, but starved himself to death. And as to clemency, tis said of a tiger, the most cruel of all beasts, that a kid having been put into him, he suffered a two days hunger rather than hurt it, and the third broke the grate he was shut up in to seek elsewhere for prey so unwilling he was to fall upon the kid, his familiar and his guest. And as to the laws of familiarity and agreement, formed by conversation, it ordinarily happens that we bring up cats, dogs, and hares, tame, together. But that which seamen by experience know and particularly in the Sicilian Sea, of the quality of the Halcyons, surpasses all human thought of what kind of animal has nature even so much honoured the birth. The poets indeed say that one only island, Delos, which was before a floating island, was fixed for the service of Latona's lying in but god has ordered that the whole ocean should be stayed made stable and smooth without waves without winds or rain whilst the halcyon produces her young which is just about the solstice the shortest day of the year so that by her privilege we have seven days and seven nights in the very heart of winter wherein we may sail without danger. Their females never have to do with any other male but their own, whom they serve and assist all their lives without ever forsaking him. If he becomes weak and broken with age, they take him upon their shoulders and carry him from place to place and serve him till death but the most inquisitive into the secrets of nature could never yet arrive at the knowledge of the wonderful fabric wherewith the halcyon builds her nest for her little ones, nor guess at the materials. Plutarch, who has seen and handled many of them, thinks it is the bones of some fish which she joins and binds together, interlacing them, some lengthwise and others across, and adding ribs and hoops in such manner that she forms at last a round vessel fit to launch. Which being done, and the building finished, she carries it to the beach, where the sea beating gently against it shows where she is to mend what is not well jointed and knit, and where better to fortify the seams that are leaky, that open at the beating of the waves. And, on the contrary, what is well built and has had the due finishing, the beating of the waves does so close and bind together that it is not to be broken or cracked by blows either of stone or iron without very much ado and that which is more to be admired is the proportion and figure of the cavity within, which is composed and proportioned after such a manner as not to receive or admit any other thing than the bird that built it, for to anything else it is so impenetrable, close, and shut, 
nothing can enter, not so much as the water of the sea. This is a very dear description of this building, and borrowed from a very good hand, and yet, methinks, it does not give us sufficient light into the difficulty of this architecture. Now from what vanity can it proceed to despise and look down upon, and disdainfully to interpret, effects that we can neither imitate nor comprehend? To pursue a little further this equality and correspondence betwixt us and beasts, the privilege our soul so much glorifies herself upon, of things she conceives to her own law, of stripping all things that come to her of their mortal and corporeal qualities, of ordering and placing things she conceives worthy her taking notice of, stripping and divesting them of their corruptible qualities, and making them to lay aside length, breadth, depth, weight, color, smell, roughness, smoothness, hardness, softness, and all sensible accidents as mean and superfluous vestments, to accommodate them to her own immortal and spiritual condition. As Rome and Paris, for example, that I have in my fancy, Paris that I imagine, I imagine and comprehend it without greatness and without place, without stone, without plaster, and without wood. This very same privilege, I say, seems evidently to be in beasts. For a courser accustomed to trumpets, to musket shots and battles, whom we see start and tremble in his sleep and stretched upon his litter as if he were in a fight, it is almost certain that he conceives in his soul the beat of a drum without noise, and an army without arms and without body. Quippe videbis equos fortes cum membra jacebunt, in somnis, sudare tamen, spirareque saipe, et quasi de palma sumas contendere vires. You shall see managed horses in their sleep, sweat, snort, start, tremble, and a clutter keep, as if with all their force they striving were, the victor's palm proudly away to bear. The hare, that a greyhound imagines in his sleep, after which we see him pant so whilst he sleeps, stretch out his tail, shake his legs, and perfectly represents all the motions of a course, is a hare without fur and without bones. When antumque canes in moli saipe quiete, jactant crura tamen subito, vocesque repente, mitunt, et crebras reducunt naribus auras, ut vestigia si teneant inventa ferarum, ex perge factique secuntur inania saipe, cervorum simulacra, fugae quasi dedita cernant, donec discusis redeant erroribus ad se and hounds stir often in their quiet rest, spending their mouths as if upon a quest, snuff and breathe quick and short, as if they went in a full chase upon a burning scent. Nay, being waked, imagined stags pursue, as if they had them in their real view, till, having shook themselves more broad awake, they do at last discover the mistake. The watch-dogs that we often observe to snarl in their dreams, and afterwards bark out and start up as if they perceived some stranger at hand. The stranger that their soul discerns is a man spiritual and imperceptible, without 
dimension, without color, and without being. Consueta domi catulorum blanda propago, degere, saipe levem ex oculis volucremque soporem, discutere et corpus de terra corripere instant, proinde quasi ignotas facies atque ora tueantur. The fawning whelps of household curs will rise, and, shaking the soft slumber from their eyes, oft bark and stare at every one within, as upon faces they had never seen. To the beauty of the body, before I proceed any further, I should know whether or no we are agreed about the description. Tis likely we do not well know what beauty is in nature and in general, since to our own human beauty we give so many diverse forms, of which, were there any natural rule and prescription, we should know it in common as the heat of the fire. But we fancy the forms according to our own appetite and liking. Torpis Romano Belgicus Ore Color A German hue ill suits a Roman face. The Indians paint it black and tawny, with great swelled lips, wide flat noses, and load the cartilage betwixt the nostrils with great rings of gold, to make it hang down to the mouth. As also the under lip with great hoops, enriched with precious stones, that weigh them down to fall upon the chin, it being with them a singular grace to show their teeth even below the roots. In Peru, the greatest ears are the most beautiful, which they stretch out as far as they can by art. And a man now living says that he has seen in an eastern nation this care of enlarging them in so great repute, and the ear loaded with so ponderous jewels, that he did with great ease put his arm, sleeve and all, through the whole of an ear. There are elsewhere nations that take great care to black their teeth, and hate to see them white, whilst others paint them red. The women are reputed more beautiful, not only in Biscay, but elsewhere, for having their heads shaved, and, which is more, in certain frozen countries, as Pliny reports. The Mexicans esteem a low forehead a great beauty, and, though they shave all other parts, they nourish hair on the forehead and increase it by art, and have great breasts in so great reputation that they affect to give their children suck over their shoulders. We should paint deformity so. The Italians fashion it gross and massy, the Spaniards gaunt and slender, and amongst us one has it white, another brown, one soft and delicate, another strong and vigorous. One will have his mistress soft and gentle, others haughty and majestic. Just as the preference in beauty that Plato attributes to the spherical figure, the Epicureans give rather to the pyramidal or square, and cannot swallow a god in the form of a bowl. But be it how it will, nature has no more privileged us in this from her common laws than in the rest. And if we will judge ourselves aright, we shall find that, if there be some animals less favored in this than we, there are others, and in greater number, that are more. A multis animalibus decore vincimur. 
many animals surpass us in beauty even among the terrestrial our compatriots for as to those of sea setting the figure aside which cannot fall into any manner of proportion being so much another thing in color clearness smoothness and arrangement we sufficiently give place to them and no less in all qualities to the aerial and this prerogative that the poets make such a mighty matter of our erect stature looking towards heaven our original pronaque cum spectent animalia caetera teram os homini sublime dedit celumque videre jussit et erectus ad sidera tolere vultus whilst all the brutal creatures downward bend their sight and to their earthly mother tend he set man's face aloft that with his eyes uplifted he might view the starry skies is truly poetical for there are several little beasts who have their sight absolutely turned towards heaven and i find the gesture of camels and ostriches much higher raised and more erect than ours what animals have not their faces above and not before and do not look opposite as we do and that do not in their natural posture discover as much of heaven and earth as man and what qualities of our bodily constitution in plato and cicero may not indifferently serve a thousand sorts of beasts those that most resemble us are the most despicable and deformed of all the herd for those as to outward appearance and form of visage are baboons simia quam similis turpissima bestia nobis how like to man in visage and in shape is of all beasts the most uncouth the ape as to the internal and vital parts the hog in earnest when i consider man stark naked even in that sex which seems to have greatest share of beauty his defects natural subjection and imperfections i find that we have more reason than any other animal to cover ourselves and are to be excused from borrowing of those to whom nature has in this been kinder than to us to trick ourselves out with their beauties and hide ourselves under their spoils their wool feathers hair and silk let us observe as to the rest that man is the sole animal whose nudities offend his own companions and the only one who in his natural actions withdraws and hides himself from his own kind and really tis also an effect worth consideration that they who are masters in the trade prescribe as a remedy for amorous passions the full and free view of the body a man desires for that to cool the ardor there needs no more but freely and fully to see what he loves ille quod obscenus in aperto corpore partes viderat in cursu qui fuit haesit amor the love that's tilting when those parts appear open to view flags in the hot career and although this receipt may peradventure proceed from a nice and cold humour it is notwithstanding a very great sign of our deficiencies that use 
and acquaintance should make us disgust one another. It is not modesty so much as cunning and prudence that makes our ladies so circumspect to refuse us admittance into their cabinets before they are painted and tricked up for the public view. Nec veneres nostras hoc fallit, quo magis ipsae omnia sumo pere hos vitae post scenia celant, quos retinere volunt ad strictoque esse in amore. Of this our ladies are full well aware, which make them with such privacy and care behind the scene all those defects remove likely to check the flame of those they love whereas in several animals there is nothing that we do not love and that does not please our senses so that from their very excrements we do not only extract wherewith to heighten our sauces but also our richest ornaments and perfumes this discourse reflects upon none but the ordinary sort of women and is not so sacrilegious as to comprehend those divine supernatural and extraordinary beauties which we see shine occasionally among us like stars under a corporeal and terrestrial veil as to the rest, the very share that we allow to beasts of the bounty of nature, by our own confession, is very much to their advantage. We attribute to ourselves imaginary and fantastic good, future and absent good, for which human capacity cannot of herself be responsible, or good that we falsely attribute to ourselves by the license of opinion as reason knowledge and honor and leave to them for their dividend essential durable and palpable good as peace repose security innocence and health health i say the fairest and richest present that nature can make us insomuch that philosophy even the stoic is so bold as to say that heraclitus and phericides could they have trucked their wisdom for health and have delivered themselves the one of his dropsy and the other of the lousy disease that tormented him they had done well by which they set a greater value upon wisdom, comparing and putting it into the balance with health, than they do with this other proposition, which is also theirs. They say that if Circe had presented Ulysses with the two potions, the one to make a fool become a wise man, and the other to make a wise man become a fool, that Ulysses ought rather to have chosen the last than consent to that by which Circe changed his human figure into that of a beast, and say that wisdom itself would have spoken to him after this manner. Forsake me, let me alone, rather than lodge me under the body and figure of an ass. How? the philosophers, then will abandon this great and divine wisdom for this corporeal and terrestrial covering. It is then no more by reason, by discourse, and by the soul that we excel beasts. Tis by our beauty, our fair complexion, and our fine symmetry of parts, for which we must quit our intelligence, our prudence, and all the rest. Well, I accept this open and free confession. Certainly they knew that those parts, 
upon which we so much value ourselves, are no other than vain fancy. If beasts then had all the virtue, knowledge, wisdom, and stoical perfection, they would still be beasts, and would not be comparable to man, miserable, wicked, mad man. For, in short, whatever is not as we are is nothing worth, and God, to procure himself an esteem among us, must put himself into that shape, as we shall show anon by which it appears that it is not upon any true ground of reason, but by a foolish pride and vain opinion, that we prefer ourselves before other animals, and separate ourselves from their society and condition. End of section 43